I just uh, take this, uh, attend these courses, Santosh. This, I mean, uh, over a period of time, it's, uh, you know, it goes up and up. Within a week, about 500 would have seen, within three days, actually. Oh. And, and the older ones, which we had six months ago, have crossed 5,000, 6,000 views. Wow. I mean, this is, congratulations to you. I mean, you, I know you put in a lot of work into training the postgraduates in India. I mean, tremendous work. Uh, I, 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 I just have to say congratulations. Say anything I can do to, to help this process, please let me know. I, I will always make time and whatever it, it takes. Okay, so keep me in mind for any help that you need. Uh, please do not hesitate. So we are live. Hello, so we are live, sir. Varlika, please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, Lecture 146 in Glaucoma Session 50. And we are back to our international masterclass series with Professor Ramesh Ayala. And he'll be talking on changing pace of glaucoma surgery. I request, sir, to please introduce Professor Ramesh, sir. Okay, so it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce such a big luminary in ophthalmology, Professor Ramesh Ayala. He is a world-renowned ophthalmologist and he is presently a professor and chair of ophthalmology at the University of South Florida, Tampa, Florida, where he has holds the James P. and the Health Guilds Chair in Ophthalmology. Prior to University of Southern, uh, South Florida, Dr. Ayala was a tenured professor of ophthalmology, director of glaucoma services and residency fellowship director at Tulane University. He is a graduate of Gandhi Medical College, Osmania University in Hyderabad. He received his residency training in ophthalmology at Mercy Regional Hospital, United Kingdom and the USF, Tampa, Florida. Dr. Ayala completed his glaucoma fellowship as Massachusetts Eye and Ear, Harvard Medical School, and his Cornea and External Diseases Fellowship at Boston University Medical Center. Dr. Ayala is a board certified on three continents, that is India, UK, and USA. And he is running a teaching program in India as well, where he is uh, training lots of postgraduate students. In addition to his clinical and chair responsibility, Dr. Ayala is involved in daily basis in the teaching of residents and fellows. Dr. Ayala pioneered transitional research involving slow-release drug delivery system. His other research interest includes the glaucoma diagnostic tools and glaucoma surgical outcomes. His research has resulted in numerous publications and presentations worldwide. Dr. Ayala is passionate in treating the patients. He thrives on treating difficult ocular cases. And he not only treats the glaucoma, but he treats the cornea because he did his cornea fellowship as well. So, Dr. Ayala, it's all yours, and we are looking forward to hear you uh, on glaucoma surgeries. Oh, thank you. Uh, can somebody share my screen? Okay, share already. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Slide show. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Santosh and the rest of the team. I really, uh, I, I enjoy teaching uh, postgraduates throughout the world, but especially in India. Um, uh, so I, well, my apologies, today happened to be my surgery day. I did not realize it until it's too late. Uh, so I'm in the operating room. If you see nurses walking behind me or there's some background noise, my deep apologies. Okay, I just finished. Um, a couple of cases, one with congenital glaucoma and uh, the other one is a straightforward cataract and I'm here. Uh, so today we're gonna touch on the changing phase of glaucoma surgery. I will try and uh, uh, there, here are some of my patterns and financial disclosures and I'll declare those, you know, where there's some financial interest uh, in the interest of uh, uh, transparency. But what I wanted to show you is glaucoma is, is been evolving, the treatment of glaucoma has been evolving for the longest period of time. Unfortunately, it's been drops, 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 and diamox. 
uh, for glaucoma patients, and that's not the ideal situation. 50% of glaucoma deserves to be surgically treated. There's a lower pyramid of glaucoma that can be mild, moderate glaucomas that can be controlled with medications, but a whole host of glaucomas beyond that needs to be surgically treated. Let's look at the surgical glaucoma timeline. As you can see, it started in 1950s by one Graffe when he accidentally did a rototomy with his one Graffe blade. And without realizing it, he cured angle closure glaucoma in some of the patients. They had no idea as to why the pressure went down and patients became pain free in his practice in Austria, in Europe back in the day because the difference between open angle and closed angle glaucoma came out around 1900s. Um, that differentiation was not available to, uh, uh, to one graphy at that time. But in 1900s, people tried a whole bunch of things like uh, including inserting horse hair, glass rods and steel tubes, et cetera, um, that did not work too well. And then 1940s and 50s came around the goniotomy essentially for uh, congenital glaucoma. And they did try it in adults in the back in the day, it did not work. Um, the 50s and 60s uh, saw the evolution of full thickness sclerostomies with all the complications of flat chambers and immediate postoperative hypotony, et cetera, with coral effusions. Um, and in 60s and 70s, trabeculectomy and modifications of trabeculectomy and iodinclysis came into, uh, into existence. Now, because of all of those uh, postoperative complications, glaucoma surgery really um, uh, developed a bad reputation. Um, and so a lot of people hesitated doing glaucoma surgery. In 70s and 80s, uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s, the different glaucoma drainage devices came into existence. Maltino developed his original implant in 1969, and various modifications were introduced in 70s, somewhere between 70s and 80s. George Barwell developed his implant in the 80s and 90s, and Ahmed uh, soon after. Um, and then in 19, uh, 1990s to 2000, uh, people started using the antifibrotics because they realized fibrosis is the main enemy that's killing this glaucoma surgery success rate. 2010 onwards, the introduction of mix um, uh, revolutionized glaucoma treatment to some degree for mild, moderate glaucomas. And I'll give you my two cents and where the future is going to be you know, from 2020 to 2030 on. So let's start with the uh, age old glaucoma surgery. A lot of these, as you know, are uh, uh, divert the aqueous into the subconjectal space. Evolved in 1960s is trabeculectomy. Diverts the aqueous into subconjectal space was sclerectomy or keratectomy. Um, the fluid flow regulation initially is through by the scleral flap and sutures, whereas in the long term, it's subconjectal fibrosis that decides how much of the fluid is going to go out and what the end intraocular pressure is going to be. Now, we do use metamycin routinely to reduce postoperative fibrosis and improve success rate in these patients. Now, in my own hands, the, the success rate of, uh, of uh, trabeculectomy is uh, we end up with pressures of about 13 millimeters of mercury. All these uh, things that I'm quoting, I've published on them, so I know uh, these are true in my hands. So, so 13 millimeters of mercury in, in two years on one med with 30% failure rate in mixed population. When I say mixed population, I uh, practiced for a long time in New Orleans, where we have a huge population of uh, white and black population, along with uh, some sprinklings of Latino and Indian uh, people. And now, every operation comes with a, uh, 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 a complication because of time. I'm going to show you some modifications that have evolved in my uh, surgical practice. Um, one of the major problems, other than uh, fibrosis that you face is cystic leaky bluffs with, uh, with the trabeculectomy operation. For a long time, people used to go back and excise those cystic bluffs and draw the conjunctiva, resulting in 50% failure rate. So what we have done is to modify this technique of uh, conjunctival dissection, leaving the tenons and the draining blood vessels of the blub intact, and reshape the size of the blub with the help of cautery, uh, peel off the epithelium, drape it with the amniotic membrane graft, and then drape the conjunctiva on top of it. Once we did this, the success rate of this uh, went up to 90% in the postoperative period. I have long-term follow-up on these patients. They do remarkably well. So why do we need the amniotic membrane? It forms a sticky glue between, that, uh, between the conjunctiva that they're gonna draw on top of it and, 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 uh, and, uh, and the results are much better with the amniotic membrane than without the amniotic membrane. So for the conjunctiva, because of uh, the, uh, you know, you want to have adequate conjunctiva to close the blood, 
we do relaxing in sessions in the, into the tenons routinely. It's a superficial you know, uh, conjunctival dissection with a 15 degree blade that relaxes the conjunctiva, creates enough conjunctiva for you to draw it down to the limbus and suture it. And uh, our results have been spectacular with this technique. And this is what I do when I have this leaky cystic collapse. Um, how about express miniature uh, shunts? This was introduced in 2003, uh, developed in Israel by Dr. Belkins and FDA approval in the United States came around 2003. Um, the, the way to do the surgery is the 27 gauge needle into the anterior chamber. Um, it's uh, about 400 microns external diameter, 50 microns internal diameter, uh, and about three millimeters long. Now, at two years, Peter Netlin's group showed that the intraocular pressure is comparable between the trap and the expression. So this is how you do the expression. Um, as you can see, in the, in the beginning stages, when, uh, when they marketed expression, they said it's a five minute procedure, lift the conjunctiva and stick the uh, express under the, uh, uh, under the conjunctiva into the AC. A lot of those cases resulted in uh, uh, hypotony and exposures and super cold hemorrhages and infections. We were the first group to have reported the complications of express and suggested modifications. Um, and so they modified the surgical technique into a trap modification you know, here you create the flap just like a trapeclectomy, but the entry instead of a sclerotomy, you take a 27 gauge needle, enter into the AC and then inject the express um, um, from the device and release it and then close the flap on top of that. So it's an expensive trapeclectomy modification if you like. Um, now, once you do a procedure, I am a strong believer in knowing how to uh, uh, manage the complications. So you should not do a procedure wherein you don't know how to man manage the complications. So with the, with the express um, erosion, conjunctival and scleral flap erosions, exposing the steel, the metallic uh, express is a pretty common complication. There are a couple of different ways to tackle this, an external technique using the uh, 15 degree blade to dissect it out or you can do an internal technique where you can uh, use a bent VVR and MVR blade in the opposite, 180 degrees opposite. I, under a gonium view, what you do is to cut out the, uh, the limbus from within on either side under viscoelastic cover and use a micro forceps to, to pull it out. And that technique works very nicely. Uh, minimal destruction. Um, you don't need to disturb the conjunctiva or line conjunctiva. And you can see I can safely pull the express out um, and the recovery is much, much faster than the other technique that is shown. How about Zen? Um, I don't know if Zen has been introduced in India yet. It's a new age technique that's been um, in the market for the last three years or four years or so now in the United States. Uh, it's a gel stent approved by FDA in 2016. It's inserted ab internal or ab external. It does not need any conjunctival dissection. It diverts the aqueous humor subpetrial space via gel stent. Fluid regulation is by the length and the inner diameter of the gel, but in the long term, just like any other subpetrial surgeries that we do, the fibrosis decides the success rate of this uh, technique. Here is a demonstration of how we do the gel insertion. You'll see the ab internal technique. Um, so we give a subconjunctival injection of myromycin initially, mark out three millimeters posterior limbus, and then in the opposite direction, you make a little paracentesis under viscoelastic coverage. I mean, and the go under gonio view, you can see the needle coming out of the angle into the subconjunctival space, and then we inject the express, I mean, the, the Zen, release it and come out. And the more recent technique that we've been using instead of doing a paracentesis and all the other maneuvers is to do a subconjunctival ab external approach, which literally takes you three minutes to do. Uh, here, is, uh, here is a technique that I use, um, subconjunctival um, um, uh, entry point, and you enter 2.5 millimeters posterior limbus into the AC, midway between cornea and the iris, release the Zen with about a millimeter and a half into the AC and the rest of the Zen sticking the subconjunctival space followed by myromycin injection and you're done, literally. Problem with Zen is the inner diameter of the Zen is 40 microns, 43 microns. So all it takes is a couple of fibroblasts to migrate into the area of the opening of the Zen and the tube is gonna, um, the, the, it's gonna fail. Um, but at two years, so we did a one year study comparing traps in, uh, in Zen's in our own hands. They're pretty comparable. 
with the higher incidence of early failure with Zen and a lot of needling of the bloods, et cetera, and uh, higher uh, usage of post-operative medications, glaucoma medications in the Zen group. But then results, we got about 14, 15 millimeters of milk of the Zen, 13 millimeters with the trap as to be expected. Um, so it's an expensive way of doing traps, all of these techniques. Now, one other thing that you realize is this, when you create a blob, subconjunctal uh, collection of fluid, it tends to fibrose over a period of time. Um, and yeah. what do we do in those situations is, is the key uh, question, right? Uh, I, I think when multiple visits to India have demonstrated how to do this reclamp manure procedures, um, here, this, uh, this gentleman had congenital glaucoma, that blob that you're seeing was originally created by Shea himself in 1970s. That was one of the last surgeries he apparently performed. He came with pressures of 50. And all I did for him was a slit lamp two minute procedure using a 30 gauge needle and cut out the scar tissue at the slit lamp, which is what you're seeing, that resulted in this nice formation of blood. You see this, and then followed by mitomycin injection at the very end. Till today, this well, I did this about two years ago. I just saw this man the last week. Specials are still controlled at uh, 10 millimeters of mercury is done remarkably well. So you, you can save a lot of these blobs by doing these mitomycin uh, injections in the post-operative period and blood patients, as I call them, with the 30 gauge needle at the slit lamp and increase the success rate of this, uh, this uh, trupeclectomy operations into the long term. How about acute angle closure glaucomas? As you know, classic treatment, when a patient with acute angle closure glaucoma comes to you, you want to give IV mannitol and then do a yak the eye when the cornea clears up to some degree, and that takes all day long. So for the last 15 years, I've changed my techniques into using my 30 gauge needle. Uh, here is a patient at the slit lamp, presented acutely with angle closure glaucoma. I put in a 30 gauge needle um, into the AC. Within two minutes, within a minute, less than a minute, you can see cornea clears up. All it takes is a drop of aqueous to be drained out. Cornea clears up, the attack is broken. And once the attack is broken, what, what do I do? I do a narrowplasty on this patient with 360 degrees with the argon laser. This is a great technique, underutilized, but instead of doing EIPI, EI, think of doing another plastic, pull the eye away from the angle. Then do your EIPI and with a clear cornea. Patient will tolerate this much better. And then you end up a week or two weeks later when the eye is quieter, you want to take the cataract out. Um, 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 and, and that really is the, is the key for all of these acute angle closure glaucoma management. 30 gauge needle, add presentation, decompress the AC, let the cornea clear up, do an aridoplasty followed by PI, use your glaucoma medications and pretfortin, moxifloxacin, antibiotic drop for a couple of weeks, let the eye quieten down, take the cataract out, and then do a prophylactic lens, uh, cataract, lens extraction for the other eye so the patient never goes through this um, acute attack in the other eye. So that's my practice for the last 15 years now for all these acute angle closure glaucomas that present my way. Um, I don't play around with this. There's absolutely no indication for us to play around with these eyes. We know when it affects in one eye, more than likely it's going to happen in the other eye. So I'm very proactive in my treatment for these kind of glaucomas. Um, how about cataract surgery alone? Now we do have enough evidence that in patients with mild moderate glaucomas, just taking the cataract alone is going to reduce the intraocular pressure by about two, three millimeters of mercury, and that can be sustained for about uh, two to four years of um, uh, time period. Let's move on to mix. Um, it's the uh, mix over the years has evolved itself, uh, where it we divert aqueous into the into the Schlems canal, um, bypassing the triple mesh work. Here is a classic example of the original ice tent of, uh, being inserted through the triple mesh work into the Schlems canal as uh, being inserted by Ike uh, Ahmed, who has been at the the forefront of a mixed revolution. And this is an example of Kahoot door blade where about three to four clock hours of the triple mesh work is being stripped, um, opening the Schlems canal directly into the AC. And uh, uh, somebody like me, we like to mix a lot of mixed procedures. Here I'm doing not only the, the Kahoot blade, but also combining that with the ECP or endopsychophotocoagulation to achieve much better results. I'll give you an example of how this, uh, this can be effectively deployed yeah. in your practice. Here is a patient with plateauitis syndrome that's post-iridoplasty and has not responded. 
um, having a very high pressures still in the post period. So in those kind of patients where the medications and uh, PI and myotics fail, you want to take the cataract out. And you can see in gonio view, the angle is, is shut down. So what do we do? Here is an example of how to strip the angle open. Well, uh, one thing that is in the literature, um, and I do remember multiple speakers pointing this out in my multiple trips to India. Once the angle is closed, the, the trabecular mesh wearing slim skin only does not function. That's not true. Almost 70, 80% of those patients do respond to goniosiniculysis and opening of the angle. Here, it may bleed a little bit, but that's okay. Um, you strip the angle 360 degrees. Here, in this example, I'm doing it with my 30 gauge needle. I mean, sorry, micro forceps. And you can see the angle is opened up, but there's still some narrow areas there indicating that the ciliary process is a turn upwards or pushing down the, on the iris. So what do I do now? I, I go into the sulcus uh, using the, the curve, the probe, the ECP, and, uh, and apply diode laser to the ciliary processes to sh both shrink the ciliary processes and also um, to reduce the aqueous protection in the postoperative period. By the way, ECP can reduce the intraocular pressure by about two to three points, but it's not sustained in my experience at least more than a year. Usually between six and nine months, the, the reduction in the intraocular pressure from ECP uh, normalizes. And you can see a nice example of how the ciliary processes are uh, shrunk with the application of the diode laser, and that results in wide opening of the angle. And this particular patient never developed another attack of uh, angle closure. You can see the AC is now deep and you can see the angle is wide open uh, on gonio view. And you end this kind of cases with injection of canalog, diluted canalog into the sulcus to decrease postoperative uh, inflammation. And they do very well. So in all chronic angle closure glaucoma splatoviris syndrome, this is the technique that they use. I don't go straight to trabeculectomy. I'd rather take the lens out, do angle manipulations and ECP. And this combination seems to work for me in majority of the patients. You'll be surprised. Try and do these kind of techniques for these patients and it does work. Now, I don't know if Micropulse is available in India. Uh, this is a Cyclo G6 laser system um, um, manufactured by Iridex. Uh, we did a large study published in 2018 on about 200 eyes from um, uh, my, my practice and my fellow's practice. And we found that it work efficacy is about 70% in primary open angle glaucoma patients. It's not so good in patients with secondary glaucoma like neovascular glaucoma, PKP glaucoma, UGA glaucoma. I did not find that the, the efficacy is really that hard. So I don't use this technique that frequently anymore. Now, so where is mix going, right? I mean, here is an example of, uh, um, Iceland W that's recently um, uh, introduced. The idea here is instead of one Iceland, you want to inject two Icelands, one in the supranasal quadrant, one in the infranasal quadrant where the collector channels are located so as to create a straight pathway or a highway to the collector channels bypassing the rest of the canal system, right? So I've been doing the, the dual Iceland system now for about a year or so. Still the pressures are about maybe a couple of points better than the single eye stent, but not impressive enough. Uh, there is a newer device that's been FDA approved called the Hydras, that is a much longer device that goes into larger six up in the Schlumps canal by about three clock hours. Here is, a here is the way um, it looks on gonio view. You know, in my practice, this uh, also resulted in pressures of 16, for probably in the range of 15 to 16. And then the third technique that we're using a lot nowadays is called Omni, wherein the device comes with a proline uh, stent inside it with a helon inject injectable helon in it. And the way to do this is to uh, open up the trabecular mesh work, enter the Schlem's canal and the large the proline 360 degrees and strip the trabecular mesh work to some degree. So it's some viscodilation of the rest of the 180 degree angle and stripping of the mesh work resulting in um, combination of goniotomy and viscodilation. I can tell you from personal experience, no matter what technique I use, the end intraocular pressure is around 16 millimeters of mercury. So if this is something that will fit into your practice patterns uh, for mild moderate glaucomas is something that you can use. Um, patients with advanced glaucoma, none of these techniques can give you the pressures, low enough uh, pressures. Um, so 
What's the future of mix? It is here to stay. There's no question about it. In combination with cataract surgery, these techniques really help you uh, with minimal complications. Complication rate with mix is pretty close to zero. So, and you can have sustained lower intraocular pressure in mild patients, moderate patients uh, into the long term. And it's sustained, at least in my practice, up to five years that I followed them now in my own practice. So it will give you low pressures um, and prevent further worsening of these mild, moderate glaucoma to advanced stage glaucoma patients. So it's a, that's the way to look at mix. How about glaucoma drainage devices? Uh, the key thing about glaucoma drainage devices is the 30% failure rate in five years, again from fibrosis. 30% exhibit a hypertensive phase, which is um, encapsulation around the blub, around the plate area in the immediate post-operative period. When I say immediate, we're talking about the first three months. 30% corneal decomposition in five years from a variety of re for a variety of reasons. Tube touch is one of them, but I think a lot of us are now better surgeons and we know how to insert this into the surface or on the surface of the iris far away from cornea. Um, I, we did rabbit model studies to suggest that the corneal decomposition is probably a result of nutritional steel with the decreased oxygen supply, interruption of the, um, of the, of the way the, the aqueous circulation in the anterior chamber uh, and, and decreased nutritional um, uh, supply to the corneal endothelium. The tube erosions, infections, and post op fibrosis are the main problems that you find other than corneal decomposition in these patients. These are the wide varieties of tubes that are available in the market. I do know that in India, uh, our wind system has produced a borrowed equivalent. Uh, these are the, all the difference between the Ameth valve um, and, um, and the borrowed implant is pretty simple. With the Ameth valve, there's a valvular mechanism which is what you're seeing here, that regulates the, the flow, fluid flow in the immediate post-operative period to some degree. Whereas with the, the Arvin system or the Barwell system or the new modified um, Ahmed valve called the clear path, it's a, it's a straight tube attached to a plate. The problem with this is uh, there's too much fluid that gets out of the eye causing hypotony and hypotony related complications. So when you use this kind of tubes, you got to modify these tubes with the vical tie, there are different techniques that are described. Um, and, uh, you know, if given the opportunity, um, description of all of those techniques, etc., will take me a couple of hours to go through. In the interest of time, um, hoping that you will find a YouTube video to, to learn the different techniques of insertion and modifications. Um, suffice to say that here, um, I will show you some techniques that you may find useful. Uh, for those experienced um, with the uh, initial insertion of the valves, uh, valve techniques. Here is a patient with scleroderma, Kachikta is completely plastered um, and, and with pressures of 40, there's no 360 degree conjectival adhesions to the, to the limbus. So what do you do in this kind of cases? A lot of people would have done uh, ciliary body destructive procedures, which I hate. Uh, there's a reason why God created aqueous, which is to bring in nutrition into the eye. So. There has never been a case where I could not do a successful implant, by the way. So here is a modification that I, that, that I want to show you. Instead of conjunctival dissection, what you want to do is the superficial scleral dissection. Carry the superficial scleral dissection for about four millimeters posterior limbus, and then you can jump yourself into the subconjunctival space very easily after that, followed by insertion of a pediatric amet valve, as I'm gonna demonstrate here. You see, there's enough room there for me to place a pediatric amet valve that saved the day for this particular patient. Um, now, encapsulation is a problem, as you can see in the second video, and uh, uh, you can do a needling procedure for this encapsulation with the injection of mitomycin into the blood. You can do this multiple times, and that will decrease encapsulation and fibrosis, and uh, you can improve the success rate. You can see as I needling the blood, the height of the blood is increasing. Um, and the, this can give you 50% success rate in, in, at the end of two years follow up. Now, sometimes one of the main reasons why these uh, amet valves in tubes fail is because of fibrous ingrowth into the valve mechanism itself. And in those cases, you can do a blubectomy, as I call it, and go into the valve and fish out the, the fibrous ingrowth and then apply mitomycin all around the edge and close the conjunctiva. Um, as I'm trying to demonstrate in that uh, in the video on the on the right hand side, 
Uh, and that technique also gives you about 50% success rate because fibrosis is gonna come back uh, uh, in the long term, causing failure of these the tubes. One of the last problems that you will face with, uh, with the tube uh, surgery sometimes is hypotony. Um, so when you have persistent hypotony, what do you do um, in these patients? The simple technique here is to do a paracentesis um, and click on here, pull the tube out into the AC, and then tie a vicro or tenoproline in this instance, which is what I'm tying. Tie the tube shut with the tenoproline and then drop it back and close the cornea with a single incision, a single tenonylon suture, you're done. Rather than digging the entire conjectival dissection and digging out the plate, et cetera, this is a very simple five minute technique um, that saves the day for you. So you hear over and over again, all of the conjectile glaucoma surgeries, the reason why they fail is fibrosis, which is our main enemy. And for the last 30, 40 years, people have been using mitomycin one-time application. Um, so one-time application of mitomycin seems to work very well when we do trabeculectomy procedures. One-time mitomycin application does not work when you do a glaucoma drainage device like the Ahmed valve, the Arvind, the, uh, 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 bar work modification, right? Um, and the reason for that is this, just so you, just in case you're wondering. Um, fibroblast migration starts from the limbus and because the trabeculectomy operation is performed at the limbus, when you apply mitomycin at the limbus, it's gonna knock out this fibroblast on contact in the immediate postoperative period, resulting in much better postoperative um, uh, results. Whereas with, the, with these glaucoma drainage devices, the plate and the, and the aqueous collection is about eight to 10 millimeters posterior to the limbus. By the time you apply mitomycin, and uh, by the time the migration of fibroblasts from the limbus takes place uh, to the location of the plate, it will be about seven to 10 days. And uh, so when you apply mitomycin at the time of surgery, this, uh, it's washed out the, and its efficacy against the fibroblast is no longer there when the fibroblasts actually reach the, the destination, i.e. the plate, of these uh, devices. And so if you want to use mitomycin, you're better off injecting mitomycin into the blood two weeks post-op and, and in a serial fashion, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks is the way I do the injections of 0 0.01 cc's of mitomycin into the blood. That gives you much better results. But in any case, what we have embarked upon over the last 15 years is to create a slow release um, drug delivery system that releases mitomycin 5 few combination over a period of one month because 90% of your fibrosis happens in one month after glaucoma surgery. Here's an example of the model that we developed that we're going through FDA um, application process for IND purposes and hopefully next year we'll start the clinical trials. Um, it's a 14 micron thick, uh, like paper thin PLG wafer um, that releases the drug on contact with the aqueous. Uh, over a period of one month, and between two and three months, this uh, wafer disappears, it melts away, um, leaving a nice blab. Uh, as, as, um, so I do have patents on this, and I own the company that's trying to market this um, device. And here are some modifications of the AMET valve that, are, that we have developed. Here is one with the PLGA that's loaded with polyhema, as you can see with the purple color. This releases mitomycin low, low dosage of mitomycin every single day for the three week period after the surgery. And here is the PLGA version where uh, my combination of mitomycin and 5 fu is released over a period of one month. Um, both the techniques really work. Um, and in the rabbit models, we have shown 50% reduction in encapsulation thickness compared to the original amet valve. Um, at the end of three months. As you know, three month um, rabbit model um, is equivalent to one year results in humans. And so we are hoping that once I get the IND permission, we'll start the clinical trials and have every intention of doing these trials in India, in, um, in RP center and in our center in, uh, in Hyderabad. Uh, there are, so what is the future for glaucoma drainage devices, right? I mean, what is the future of glaucoma treatment? The drug delivery platform, um, the Allergan took the lead in this. You can see the, the, their first product in this regards is called the Durista, which is a PLGA polymer loaded with uh, their Bermatoprost or Lumigan uh, that's, that comes preloaded on the needle tip. 
And all you need to do is position the patient at the slit lamp and inject the needle into the AC, mid, mid AC, and then press the button to release the polymer. And you'll see that momentarily uh, where I release the polymer into the AC. It's literally a two second, uh, two minute, one minute procedure. Um, and once the polymer is injected, it larges into the six o'clock angle. Uh, and you can see in this example, in this picture here, it lies in the angle and it controls intraocular pressure from anywhere from three to six months. And the polymer slowly disappears um, over a period of six months. So long-term results are still awaited uh, because repeat injections, there's some concern that it may cause kind of corneal endothelial uh, damage. Now, there are other companies that are pursuing a punctal plug with, uh, uh, with latanoprost inserted in it, which seem to be controlling intraocular pressure. Here's another example of a contact lens kind of a device that's preloaded with these glaucoma medications. So all of these are in various stages of clinical trials. The only thing that's been approved by uh, FDA at this point in time is the Durista, the metaprost in clinical use, and we've been using it with some uh, with success in patients with uh, 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 intolerance to glaucoma uh, drops. We do have a uh, different technique of uh, developing this low release models using a modified hyaluronic acid. Now we do have a patent pending on this device too. Uh, this uh, porous hyaluronic acid that we created in our own lab, we are able to hook it up with antibiotics and, and anti-glaucoma medications. We are, we are running animal model studies uh, with these techniques. So in conclusion, I think 20, 20, you know, early parts of uh, 2000 till 2020 uh, belonged to mix. In the 1990s, belonged to antifibrotics, 1970s to the glaucoma drainage devices. And 2020 to 2030, I, I predict we'll see a lot of this low release drug delivery systems coming, hitting the market, improving the, the glaucoma playing field in terms of drugs available for you to inject and modify and improve the success rate of the glaucoma surgeries and also deliver the glaucoma uh, medications into the eye uh, like the retina people are doing. So with that, I think I will end my talk and take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ayala. It was really a wonderful talk and we learned a lot. You know, uh, you asked two questions. Yes, the D6 is available in India and uh, it's becoming pretty popular. I feel that around 50 to 60 units are, uh, you know, working right now and uh, more are in, in the pipeline. The Zen has not yet got uh, approval and even the company is not persuading very hard uh, to get the approval for the Zen. But otherwise, uh, for your lecture, the the management of the acute angle closer glaucoma was amazing, was fantastic, and uh, we learned a lot because we come across uh, these acute angle closer cases very often uh, than the Caucasian population. I know. Uh, uh, it was really uh, uh, amazing. Yes. So, so the other kind of glaucoma that you see very commonly in India is chronic creeping angle closure glaucoma. Um, you know, it's a mistake. It's a mistake, in my opinion. I'll, I, I'm a strong advocate of what I'm trying to say here. Don't do a trabeculectomy as an initial approach in those patients because um, the, you will develop the the likelihood of developing malignant glaucoma is much much higher with flat chambers and malignant glaucoma and all these complications. Uh, try out taking the cataract out, even if there is no cataract. Try taking a clear lens extraction out uh, and goniosynecolysis and opening up the angle as your first preferred technique before you go on to do a trypocolectomy should the initial version does not work. The reason why I say that is your complications, post-op complications following trypocolectomy after you take the lens out and creating the space and goniosynecolysis are gonna be pretty close to zero as opposed to a very, very like high likelihood of developing malignant glaucoma with shallow chambers in this uh, shallow to begin with shallow chamber creeping angle closure glaucomas. Yep, and the, you know, the second thing was, which I liked most was the goniosynecolysis. You know, our our thinking was that, that uh, once there are synecias, the trabecular meshwork will not work. 
but you have shown very clearly that you do the paniosynovial lysis and you will find that the trabecular meshwork is functional. That's really a wonderful thing. So definitely, yes, we will we will try in all this uh, creeping angle fusor glaucoma patients. But Harsh, yeah, so, uh, would you like? Yeah. yeah. So, so one yeah. word on goniocyniculysis. Um, you don't need. Uh, you know, there are different ways of doing goniocyniculysis under viscoelastic coverage. Of course, you can use your viscoelastic cannula itself in an anterior posterior fashion, tapping on the iris 360 degrees, and that will open it up to. When you do your uh, cataract extraction, you have your after the cataract is, is taken out, using the IA tip, it, it grab the iris in the midpoint of the iris and gently drag it posterior, inferior, um, towards the center of the eye, so to say, gently. And you can do that 360 degrees. That's another great way to do a 360 degree goniocyniculysis, completely atraumatic. And lastly, the technique that I, I showed in the other video, which is with the microscopes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Ayala, uh, Pratip actually must be smiling for the last 30 years. I've been trying people to get interested in aridoplasty in India, and they <laughs> don't seem to be very interested. <laughs> so, I, I simply love that, that somebody at that top has actually uh, given uh, a kudos to that technique because I do it so, so often. And as a matter of fact, uh, I am a little scared of the needle, so I actually do it as a primary procedure. And um, uh, most of the time, it does work even when nothing else is going to work, even the drugs are not working. This actually works. Mm -hmm. So we have been doing it even in uh, chronic angle closure. Uh, I have a paper way back in 90s with Professor Sood, where in chronic angle closure, we pulled open a part of the angle and we found that even three to four millimeter further lowering can be achieved. So you're absolutely right. You pull it over and it really helps in that. And as far as the uh, micropulse is concerned, yeah, the G61, uh, my, my initial problem became because the company started selling is at, uh, as a, as a uh, 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 for trabeculectomy. They said, no need for you to learn trabeculectomy. All the uh, peripheral doctors are very, very excited. Oh, now we have a machine to help with the trabeculectomy. And soon and we found out that, that it was not the way it worked. So I think everything works beautifully, but, but you have to know where to use it and how to use it. And, and every case is very, very much individualized. But thank you so much. You showed us two beautiful techniques, which I and Prateep will love because we have so many complicated cases. And uh, the one in which you, <laughs> instead of uh, in the hypotony thing, you just went into the cornea and did that. That was so beautiful. <laughs> we have never seen that before. So that was really, really wonderful. And uh, uh, I think this, we, I think more than anybody else, me and Prateep must have learned a lot at all. Uh, for the Durista thing, did you had, a, a, have you had any uh, chance reason to remove it from the anterior chamber ever? No, no. Um, the cases that I've done, they've been successful so far. We have not had an issue with Durista, but there are, um, I saw reports of uh, uh, situations where they had to go back and take it out. And it's a really simple thing. You make a paracentesis um, with your keratome and then with Visco, um, float it out and, and it, it just simply comes out. And thank you, uh, you so know, much for the technique of uh, scleral dissection. I was that that was really <laughs> so good. I, I I just never thought of that. This is and and I have I've attended thousands of seminars, but I've never heard this thing before. So thank you so yeah. much for bringing two three absolutely new things to us. Yeah, you know, um, uh, you made a very important point. People think all glaucomas are one and the same, and they offer the same standard treatment, i.e., trabeculectomy. And that's where all our mistakes are happening. All our complications are happening. Glaucoma is a very disease process. Every eye deserves to be studied individually and every eye deserves an individualized treatment uh, approach. And if uh, that can be taught to all our postgraduates, reevaluation and, and also glaucoma is a surgical disease process. I mean, this is not something that you want to play with because at the end of the day, you start uh, uh, Sing these patients away with the one drop, two drops, eventually they're all going to go blind. Um, so aggressive treatment where necessary and adequate training of our postgraduates 
so they can handle these patients um, adequately is the key to a, 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 a good management of glaucoma, especially in a country like India where the incidence of glaucoma. So it's a huge burden. I mean, six to 10, 9% of the population of this creeping angle closure glaucomas, it's a huge burden. And I think I am there with you, uh, you know, more than happy to come and to give a live demonstration of all the techniques at any, any point you guys want to put together. And and, and uh, lastly, um, if, if there is another opportunity, please count me in. I can do an extended lecture on glaucoma drainage devices. There's so many techniques that I use to make them work. Um, uh, and, and, and this is something, especially in India now with the RV system that's available in the AMETs, uh, people are getting more and more comfortable with their glaucoma drainage devices. I'm happy to share all the variety of techniques that I use um, uh, to make those uh, devices to work for me. Um, so, any other questions? Uh, yeah, you tell me, how, how would you handle this uh, very thin conjunctiva with atrophic tenons? Because, you know, very often uh, we are putting the glaucoma drainage device and we see that the conjunctiva is very fragile and the tenons is atrophic. It's very difficult to handle that conjunctiva. Uh, you, you're right. I mean, so my technique, um, uh, which you can find on YouTube, on meditrade.com, um, in was the initial dissection, I don't use um, scissors at all. I do a limbal pyridomy. And then I have this mixture of lidocaine, preservative-free lidocaine mixed with the epinephrine. So I, can, I inject that into subconjunctal space and the balloon the entire space up for me. It does a couple of things for me. One, it does the dissection for me. And two, it gives me the anesthesia. And three, it controls the bleeding to a large extent for me. And then through that space, I give some marking into the retroorbital space. And now the patient is completely anesthetized. Um, I use uh, non-tooth forceps if I'm worried about the conjunctiva. Uh, but the key again with this fragile conjunctiva is not to extend the incisions to the, uh, to the sides. You know, I like to keep the incision along the limbus if that's, uh, that makes sense. Uh, when you cut, into the, uh, into the posterior edge. If you make the, the, the vertical cut into the posterior edge, then before you realize the cut can extend more and more and more by the time you're done with the surgery. So the key is keep the anchoring, uh, the edges of the incision at the limbus itself. And if you want to widen the incision, do a wider limbal incision dissection, but don't cut posteriorly. If you cut a radial incision is done into the, into the edge of that conjunctiva, it tends to tear more and more and you end up in bigger trouble. So are the devices, Dr. Ayala, which you had described in which there's a release from the AGV of Mito and uh, 5 if you are they commercially yes. available? Uh, no, 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 they're not. Uh, so I am in the process of uh, my application is with the FDA for IND. One, I'm hoping they had one more, one more run of uh, uh, manufacturing that they asked me to do. So we are in the process of doing it. I got delayed because of COVID. So, so, so talk about supply chain issues, right? The polymers were coming from Germany, uh, mitomycin from China, um, five, uh, no, five of you from China and mitomycin from India. And uh, I, you know, for the last eight months, everything was backlogged. And so I could not finish the, the project in time, uh, but now we have access to all of them. I'm going through the final manufacturing run that FDA wants me to do. I'm hoping by the end of this year, I'll finish it. And once the FDA blesses me with IND, next year is when I'm going to bring that to, to all of you and see who wants to participate in clinical trials, because I very much like to do the clinical trials in India and yeah, the United States. That. Yeah, we'd love that. So any questions, Prateep? I, uh... Anything because I don't think that we have any question uh, on the social media. I think we have asked enough. We have troubled him enough. <laughs> <laughs> and he's ready to go back to the OT. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for teaching us so much. I, we really love you. That. Really. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank oh, you very much. An honor. Yes. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it immensely. We'll see you around soon. Yeah. yeah. Thank so, you. <laughs> already. Bye. Thank you. Bye.